while back, I read a book titled The Genius in All of Us. It summarized a lot of research and concluded that people who are very successful are not born with a set of rare genes that make them great. Success is usually the result of the interaction of your genes with your environment, plus relentless dedication and faith in your ability to succeed. It also pointed out that stressing your mind like stressing a muscle will cause a biological change that improves performance. Most of us live with a considerable amount of stress. In 1869, Francis Galton, an English anthropologist and all-around smart guy, published a book titled Hereditary Genius, in which he argued that all talent was the result of heredity. No matter what the skill, from painting a great picture to inventing a perfect recipe, it was always the result of the genes you received from your parents. A few years later, he introduced the idea of nature versus nurture, Today we know that he was smart, but he was wrong. What we are is the result of the interaction of our genes and our environment, and we're changing constantly throughout our lives. The net result, our biology is actually altered by our environment. One amazing study showed that the part of a cab driver's brain that remembers locations got bigger the longer he or she drove a cab. And there were dozens of drivers in the experiment. It's remarkable. Part of their brains actually got bigger. I began to wonder what happens to your brain when you change environments. What happens if you grew up in one culture and then suddenly moved to another? That's what happened to me. I grew up in the United States and then suddenly moved to Europe with my family. That also happened even more dramatically to a number of people I know who grew up in the traditional Chinese culture of Taiwan and then suddenly moved to the States. Did parts of our brains change shape? Did we change the way we thought? I wasn't ready to put my head into an MRI and have a brain scan but I was certainly up for a half dozen interesting interviews and a few weeks in Taiwan. Taiwan is an island off the coast of mainland China. It's 250 miles long and about 90 miles wide at its widest point. The first Europeans to get a look at it were Portuguese traders, and as soon as they saw it, they called it Ila Formosa, the beautiful island. About 23 million people live in Taiwan. Almost 98% are ethnically Chinese, and they have held on to much of their traditional culture. Every few blocks, there's a temple dedicated to one of the ancient Chinese religions. The museums are filled with traditional works of art that date back over 8,000 years. But alongside that very traditional Chinese culture is some of the most advanced 21st century technology. Taiwan is the world epicenter for the manufacturing of personal computers and cell phones. It has one of the most advanced high-speed rail systems. It's the world leader in bicycle design and actually produces and exports more bikes than any other nation. But a very interesting thing happens to a person who grows up in Taiwan with its mixture of ancient cultural values and technological skills and then moves to the United States with its stress on creativity. I, I feel like action a lot of times people take it for granted and I think we, I try to break it down into dramatic beats. And the first person I talked to was Justin Lin. Justin was born in Taiwan in 1973 and moved to Orange County, California when he was eight years old. Being an immigrant Asian-American kid and 
understanding or, or at least being exposed to the concept of underdog was such a strong thing for me. And it made me feel like I can go and do anything. Justin became a director and one of the most accomplished and promising young filmmakers in Hollywood. Welcome, Fast and the Furious, Tokyo Drift. He directed the Fast and the Furious Tokyo Drift, Fast and Furious 4, Finishing the Game, and Better Luck Tomorrow. Justin gives considerable credit to his Taiwanese background. That route and that, those choices, um, I think being an immigrant, that is the, the strength of it. Go! My first film, I, I, you know, I didn't know anybody, so I took 10 credit cards and I made it for 250,000 and went to Sundance and got bought by Paramount and everything and changed my life. Mm -hmm. And then my next film is $25 million budget. So you're going, I'm spending my whole budget on my last film before lunch on this, and it goes from 25 million to a $100 million movie. So, you know, you, you figure out as you go. I think at the end of the day, you're still trying to tell a story. Now you have more tools and more toys to, to play with. Uh, I, I, I do have uh, a lot of memories, great memories of Taiwan. Um, and I went back to Taiwan uh, with my first independent film for a film festival 25 years later. And I remember when I landed, it, it obviously changed a lot, you know. Um, but as soon as I took the first bite of food, all these memories just pop back in. Anything gooey, uh, I miss. I, I miss uh, stinky tofu a lot. And, uh, and it's usually just, I, I can't drag anyone to, with me to go. But last time I... I went back for the premiere of Fast and Furious, and so the studio's doing it up, and they're taking us all these nice restaurants, and finally I snuck out for three hours, and I'm not kidding, I had about eight meals in three hours. I love just exploring and just walking. You know, that's the thing that I really enjoy about Taiwan. I love just getting lost. I pride myself in finding a little hole in the wall, and. Uh, I, I actually, I was able to go back and find it. And it was a little dumpling place where everyone would just go eat in, in, at lunchtime. And it was amazing. You get like 12 dumplings for like 50 cents. I love exploring and finding and, and, and kind of going with your gut and, and finding where, what lo where locals go. I love the street carts. And I, I remember when I was a little kid, my dad would take me and we would go find little street carts for uh, beef noodle and stuff like that. So the... You know, I'm partial to, to that to, to that kind of eating. Well, you know, I think that technology... Steve that Chen is another perfect example of nature versus nurture. I was born in Taiwan in 1978, and I came to America in 1986. I think there was just a, a very cultural, big cultural shift between growing up in Taipei, one of the busiest thriving cities in Taiwan, to moving to the northwest suburbs of Chicago, in which we, my brother, my parents formed these sort of the only Asians in, the, in that sort of 30 mile radius. For me, first grade and second grade going to school there was a, just a distinctive difference between the schooling system, the amount of sort of strictness that was forced on kids, the amount of sort of memorization that was put onto kids. And so a lot of that influence, to me, the most memorable pieces were um, on the academic and schooling system in Taiwan as opposed to when I came to the U.S. Not exactly a lack of structure, but a, a little bit more free-form, a little bit more sort of given um, kids a little bit more liberty to, to explore things that they were interested in. Steve was interested in computers and programming, and in 1999 he moved to California and took a job with PayPal. All of us had these um, little digital cameras that we were taking pictures, but we were also taking some videos at the time. We found out that night afterwards that the pictures were very easy to share. When it came to actually sharing these videos, there was no way to share it. And so we just thought, well, there has to be a demand for a way to be able to upload, share these videos. Einstein said that imagination was more important than knowledge. And there was Steve imagining something that did not exist, an essential element for great achievers. And what was Steve's achievement? I just want to say thank you. Today we have some exciting news for you. We've 
been acquired by Google. Yeah, thanks. Thanks to every one of you guys that um, have been to YouTube, the community. Steve and his partners were the founders of YouTube, a perfect blend of Taiwanese structure and American creativity. Steve is still in touch with his Asian roots and often returns to Taiwan. I'm a big fan of tea, so there's a lot of tea that, uh, in, in Taiwan that's particularly unique to Taiwan. And then the, the food, I think everybody goes back to Taiwan for the food, but there's sort of a thriving market for a lot of these small street-side eateries that you can go to and you can experience all sorts of food. One of the places that Steve suggested was the National Palace Museum. When I first visited the museum in the early 80s, there were very few tourists. Today, it is the most visited tourist site in the nation. There are tourists from Europe, Africa, North and South America, and hundreds of thousands of Chinese tourists from the mainland who come over to see their artistic heritage. The museum was built in Taipei, Taiwan by the government of the Republic of China in 1965. The architectural style is based on the traditional Chinese palace. Four stories, green tile roofs with yellow ridges. The primary objective was to protect and preserve over 650,000 objects that represent 8,000 years of Chinese history. Porcelain has always had an important place in Chinese art. During the middle of the 1700s, a group of potters working for the emperor developed a technique for applying a brocade pattern to their works. The emperor loved it, and the vases, bowls, and jars became some of the most prized objects in the court. This bell was commissioned by King Lu over 2,000 years ago. It was made to commemorate a military victory over a neighboring ruler, formerly known as Prince, who tried to invade Lu's kingdom. With the exception of portraits, most traditional Chinese art shows giant landscapes inhabited by teeny people. The artist wanted to illustrate the point that people are insignificant in comparison to nature and its forces. The museum is an important destination for many tourists, but one of its primary objectives is to give young Taiwanese a sense of their artistic heritage, to inspire an appreciation of Chinese art. The National Palace Museum in Taipei. The museum even made an animated 3D film designed to make children aware of their artistic tradition. Better get going. The film features 50 of the museum's most famous objects coming to life after the museum closes for the night. Discover the surprises hidden within. Considering the fact that most Chinese believe that cooking is one of the great art forms, if not the greatest, it's only logical that Taiwanese National Palace Museum would open a restaurant that preserves and presents Chinese gastronomy. It's called the Silks Palace Restaurant, and it's housed in its own five-story building just across the street from the museum. It's decorated with antiques and works of art from the museum's collection. The main dining room offers a selection of traditional dishes from the eight great culinary regions of China. But its real claim to fame is a series of dishes based on the most important works of art in the museum's collection. This is the jade cabbage sculpture. It was treasured by the emperors of China and kept in the Forbidden City. The central element is a bok choy cabbage in jade, a sign of purity. The dish in the restaurant consists of the heart of a Chinese cabbage that's been boiled in broth. The Qing Dynasty meat-shaped stone was carved from agate in the 1700s. The artist stained the top so it looks like a piece of cooked pork. The restaurant's version is made from stewed pig's knuckle and has been carved into the shape of the work of art. Nicholas, please eat your art. 
but it tastes old. Oh, that's a problem when something's ancient. Yeah. As I traveled around Taiwan, one of the things I noticed was the number of temples. There are over 10,000 places of worship in Taiwan, and the dominant form is a folk religion that blends elements of Taoist, Buddhist, and Confucian philosophy. Chinese folk religion maintains that the human world and the supernatural world exist side by side and are in constant contact. They also believe that it is the responsibility of humans to send things to the inhabitants of the supernatural world in the form of offerings. The most common offering is food. And what kind of food is being offered can tell you a lot about the relationship between the person making the offering and the being in the supernatural world that it is being sent to. If the food is ready to eat, it is probably being offered to a relative or a friend and was something that that dearly departed like during his or her earthly existence. If you're making an offering to a really important god, the food will be totally unprocessed. A raw chicken, a vegetable pulled out of the ground with its roots on. The idea is to show the distance between you and the deity. The god does not need your help to feed himself. And the gods are very practical. They don't actually eat the food, they just inhale the essence. The food rests on the offering table for a while, and then it is either picked up by the person who brought it here, taken home and eaten, or distributed to the poor by the monks. It's a win-win for everybody. Some people come into the temple to get advice. The equipment used for soliciting guidance from the gods is a set of crescent divining blocks. You ask your question and drop the blocks on the floor. If they end with one round side up and one flat side up, the answer to your question is yes. If they land with both round sides up, the answer is no. If they land with both flat sides up, it means that all of the deities are busy assisting other worshipers and you should ask again later. Major hotels around the world have one or two good restaurants within their building. But Taiwan appears to believe that the more good restaurants in a hotel, the better. And they are not designed just for guests. These restaurants actually have as many local Taiwanese patrons as tourists. It's a tribute to the quality of the food and the talent and creativity of the cooks. Eddie Liu is a perfect example. He's a leading authority on Chinese food the author of a number of books on the subject, and he oversees a program that presents the classic dishes of China. Shanghainese cuisine is one of the world's great gastronomic traditions, and much of it is based on the seafood of the East China Sea. It's also influenced by the rivers, lakes, and the canals of the Yangtze Delta. Taiwan, being an island, shares much of that tradition which has made it an outstanding place to sample Shanghainese dishes in their most traditional form. Many classic Shanghainese recipes include the use of alcohol and are described as drunken. A perfect example is drunken chicken. The chefs of Taiwan also use the traditional combination of sugar and soy sauce to give a dish a sweet and sour flavor. You can always count me in for a dish of deep fried pork with sweet and sour sauce. The central point that I want to make about the cooking of Taiwan is that Taiwan is probably the best place in the world to sample all the great regional dishes developed by Chinese chefs during the past 5,000 years. And in addition, they have incorporated cuisines from other Asian traditions as well as the West. During the past 15 years, Taipei has become one of the world's gastronomic capitals. In terms of ancient gastronomy, Chinese relationship to tea goes back for thousands of years. And these days, one of the most knowledgeable people on the subject is Ellen Liu. I always brew a cup of tea for myself in the morning. Ellen was born in Taiwan and came to America when she was 22. 
Her husband is the chairman of the Tianren Group, which specializes in the highest quality tea and has over 100 shops around the world. Today, their shop in New York City's Chinatown is considered a landmark. Each tea, they have their own character. So it's like a different fragrance, different color. I like um, oolong tea. Taiwan produced the world-famous oolong tea. That's from my hometown. That's my favorite. I'm going to show you. This is a green oolong. Then I'm going to show you the one more kind. It's called black oolong. See, this shows the green color. Then this is the black oolong, which you often get from Chinese restaurant. This is called Tian Li Cha. It's one type of a high mountain green oolong. It's grown in the center part of Taiwan. The elevation is about 1,300 meters or above. In the high mountain, the sunlight in the daytime is short, okay. and it's colder weather temperature. So that factor will make tea leaf and buds tender and produce the sweeter taste. Brewing tea are the, one of the common culture in Taiwan. Um, it's uh, enjoying tea with a family or friend together. When you have a Chinese tea, first we'll ask you to um, smell the aroma first. Should I do that now? Yes, please. And then you can sip for the flavor. That's allow us to appreciate the flavor more. Very nice. Yes. Mm. It was difficult for Ellen to get her husband's business started in New York, but she kept at it. And as the research is showing, just having a good idea is not enough. It must be accompanied by persistence. It's the old line. Success is 10% inspiration and 90% perspiration. And that is central to the Taiwanese attitude. I have a distinct and painful memory of setting out to drive to a town about 50 miles south of Taipei. I had a map and it showed an expressway and it looked like I could knock it off in about an hour. What my map did not show was the fact that there was nothing express about the expressway. It was more like the nation's longest parking lot. After three hours of getting nowhere, I just turned back. Apparently, this was life in the fast lane for everyone in Taiwan. To solve the problem, the government developed Taiwan High-Speed Rail. The Taiwan High-Speed Rail is based on the technology used by the Japanese bullet train. The line runs from north to south for just over 200 miles and has a top speed of about 190 miles per hour. It will take you from one end of the island to the other in 90 minutes instead of four and a half hours. And it's environmentally responsible. The New York Times reported that a passenger traveling on a fully loaded train will use a sixth of the energy that they would use if they drove alone in a car and release only one-ninth as much carbon dioxide gas. The high-speed trains have successfully outcompeted planes. Domestic air travel has fallen by almost half, and there was a similar drop in long-distance bus travel. What we are is the result of the interaction of our genes and the environment. The people I interviewed clearly show what can happen to a structured Taiwanese childhood when it's topped off by the creative energies of the United States. I'm Bert Wolf. Whenever we edit one of our programs, we always end up with more good material than we can fit in. Interviews, stories, recipes. So we decided to put them on our website, BertWolf.com.